of the morning to you. This is Taki Ta. Today we are looking at another episode of Epic History TV. This is the World War I campaign and this is 1916. So at this point not much ground has really been made on either front. I mean the war has really only gone over for just a little over a year, year and a half, and the casualties have been through the roof. Again, this is also kind of where largely air warfare is starting to become a thing. Uh, this is after the first Zeppelin attack in Britain from the Germans. And yeah, again, as always, be sure to check out the original link down in the description down below for the original content creators. Go give Epic History TV the love and support that they will deserve. And if you have any other future video topics that you'd like to watch together, be sure to let me know down in the comments below. Yeah, let's get started. World War One was supposed to have been a short and glorious war. Yeah. But by yeah, it was, and it was like before the war started. It was like as soon as there was that first conscription of men, it was thought that they would be home by Christmas. How wrong they were. 1916, a new kind of industrialized warfare had seen the death toll soar into the millions, Especially with no gas, end in sight. Gas warfare. Naval blockades were beginning to cause shortages of food and fuel across Europe. While thousands of women had entered the workforce, replacing the men sent to fight in their millions. And that's really kind of the true tragedy too, especially just generational, where a full generations of men were lost. And it was very thankful to the women who actually took up, filled those positions and actually fueled the churn of war that was necessary on all fronts. All sides were preparing for a long war. The war has raged for a year and a half as the Allies continue to battle the Central Powers. Recent and Russia's having a hard time at this point. I mean, largely they were fairly underprepared for this scale of war. And unfortunately, the Tsar has dismissed his top general and taken full command, which is also meaning he takes full responsibility and blame things go wrong, he's just too closely tied and made himself to the war itself, and uh, it's, it's just a bad move, really. They joined by Bulgaria. And Bul Bulgaria just entered the At war. At sea. Serbia, and now that Bulgaria has entered the war, Serbia is surrounded, outmanned, and exhausted, and basically they're going to be, they're going to be out of the game. The British maintain their naval blockade of Germany, preventing the import of food and other vital raw materials. They were fighting tooth and nail on their northern front against Austro-Hungaria, uh, and they put up a good match, and basically have held their ground up until this point. Uh, but as soon as Bulgaria comes into it, I mean, it's uh, they're just so outmanned and outgunned exhausted that it's it's almost futile at this point. They're out of resources. They don't have backup. Germany has retaliated with a U-boat blockade of Britain, but has to limit its attacks to avoid provoking the neutral USA, whose citizens have already been caught in the crossfire. Yeah, and I mean, especially, I mean, I, I kind of forget that Canada is is in it is in this war um, already and I mean of course there's that uh, many conspiracies linking the US with the sinking of the Lusitania to actually have a just cause and Cassibelli to be embroiled and start joining the war uh, because they're already preparing mobilizing uh, maybe not m mobilizing but they're they're building their arms up They've really increased capacity and put most of their factories and all of this into warfare production. 
basically to supply Britain at this point. On the Western Front, French, British and Belgian troops are dug in opposite the Germans. Both sides trapped in the bloody stalemate of trench warfare. Trench warfare is terrible. On the Eastern Front, the Russians have ended their long retreat and stabilised the line. But their army has suffered huge losses. They've pulled back so far too. Like, like there was major, it was major routes, and I mean, there's only so far back more they can go. I mean, really, like, then it's 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 just tough. They they don't have the equipment really necessary, either, uh, to actually like give their men the kit they need to actually defend against the Germans or attack, let alone. On the Italian front, Italian troops have launched a series of costly, unsuccessful attacks against strong Austro-Hungarian defences. Largely been a stalemate. While on the Balkan front, the Central Powers have overrun Serbia, whose army is forced to make a bitter retreat through the Albanian mountains. Yeah, and really, the Serbs have lost just such an astronomical men just percentage of the male population of their people that like they won't recover for generations. Now on the 5th of January, Austro-Hungarian troops attack Montenegro. They are delayed at the Battle of Mojkovac, but three weeks later Montenegro is forced to surrender. I mean Montenegro is a fairly small country. It is quite picturesque. I mean, that's where they keep the Dragon Age, too. On the Caucasus front, the Russians launch a surprise winter offensive against Ottoman Turkish forces. Six weeks later, Russian troops occupy the city of Erzurum. In April, they capture the Black Sea port of Trebizond. Meanwhile, the British transport two motorboats to Lake Tanganyika in Africa. They finally arrive after a 10,000 mile yeah. trip by sea the and colonies. land and help the British seize control of the strategic lake from local German forces. Yeah, and the commander, and I forget, but like, oh, I forget where it is, but that, com that German commander, like he's one of the few generals of the time that like almost didn't lose a battle. Like he, even towards the end of the war, where Germany was co collapsing and failing, like he, he just kept fighting and just kept winning. <laughs> the same month in German Cameroon, German troops besieged on Mora Mountain for 18 months finally surrender to the Allies. It marks the end of the Cameroon him, campaign. But in, in German East Africa. On the Western Front, Verdun will go down in infamy. The Germans unleash a devastating assault on the French fortress town of Verdun. German General Erich von Falkenhayn knows France will defend this symbolic town to the last man. His plan, in his own words, is to bleed France white in its defence. It is the strategy Terrible. of attrition. Verdun becomes one of the most terrifying battles of the war. A mincing machine, where infantry divisions are destroyed almost as fast as they can be fed into the line. In Britain, one million men have already volunteered for military service. But the government realises it won't be enough. Britain becomes the last major power to introduce conscription. That spring... That's terrible. I mean... It's necessary at this point, but it's still terrible to have forced conscription. On the Western Front, British troops are the last to be issued with steel helmets. Oh wow, the I didn't even realize that. They, they didn't even have steel helmets up until this point. Jeez. The nature of trench warfare produces a high proportion of head wounds. The German Stahlhelm, the French Adrian helmet, 
and the British Mark I steel helmet offer limited protection from shell splinters and shrapnel. Neutral Portugal has been cooperating with the British, which seems to offer the best chance of holding on to her African colony. For well, I mean, yeah, and Portugal and Britain have a long-standing relationship with one another. Portuguese Angola. On the 9th of March, Germany retaliates by declaring war on Portugal. Hmm. Well, that's one on way to make them join the Allies, I guess. The Eastern Front, Russia launches an attack near Lake Narok to relieve pressure on the French at Verdun. But it's a disaster. There are 100,000 Russian casualties, and the attack fails to divert any German troops from the fighting at Verdun. In Dublin, I mean, it's a good strategy, but it just didn't work. Irish Republicans launch an armed revolt against oh, yeah. British rule. The Easter Rising, yeah, with the I forget, I forget what the political party is called now. It becomes known as the Easter Rising, and is put down after six days of street fighting. In the Middle East, after a five-month siege, British forces at Kut surrender. Kut. General Townsend leads 9,000 British and Indian soldiers into captivity. About half later die from starvation or disease. Britain wants Arab support in its fight against the Ottoman Empire. So it's promised Arab leaders an independent Arab state after the war. I mean, that's it. It's a enticing promise, but it doesn't look like they'll keep it. But now, Britain and France secretly sign the Sykes-Picot Agreement, planning after the war to... Where they divvy up their spoils of war and back... back on Divide the Middle East into British and French zones of control. Unaware of this deal, Hussein bin Ali, Sharif of Mecca, leads the Arabs in revolt against Turkish Ottoman rule. In the Battle of Mecca, his forces seize control of the Holy City. On the Italian front, Austro-Hungarian forces launch a surprise attack at Asiago. Italian defences give way. Austro-Hungarian troops are poised to break through into northern Italy. That month in the North Sea, the German High Seas Fleet clashes with the British Grand Fleet at the Battle of Jutland. In the only major naval battle of the war, the British suffer heavier losses, but claim victory as the German fleet withdraws and does not re-emerge from its base for the rest of the war. Big push just means many casualties. For the summer of 1916, the Allies have planned major simultaneous offensives against the Central Powers, from East and West. Now they are needed more than ever to relieve pressure on the French at Verdun and the Italians at Asiago. The Russians launch their attack first. On the Eastern Front, General Alexei Brusilov has carefully maintained the element of surprise. His troops break through the enemy lines, in some places wow. advancing 60 miles and taking 200,000 prisoners. That's impressive. This brilliant, though costly, Russian attack achieves its aim, as the Central Powers are forced to redeploy troops from other fronts to shore up the line. At sea, British cruiser HMS Hampshire, en route to Russia, hits a mine and sinks off Orkney. Wow. Among the 650 dead is Britain's iconic Secretary of State for War, Lord oh, Kitchener. Yeah. The guy that's on the picture. That guy. Three days later in the Adriatic, Italian troop ship Principe Umberto is sunk by a German submarine. 
It's the deadliest sinking of the war, with 1,900 lives lost. On the Western Front, Britain and France launched their major summer offensive, the Battle of the Somme. Hope yeah, the Battle of the Somme. Terrible. It's just a, a horrific battle. And if you want to see it, I'll link that down in the description down below for the Battle of the Somme. But it is, it, it's equal to Verdun. Let's just say that. I mean, Verdun is is Verdun, but I mean, the Battle of the Somme is the close second contender of the war. So high for a breakthrough, but the first day is a disaster. A long Allied artillery bombardment fails to knock out German defenses and waves of British infantry are cut down by machine gun fire as they advance into no man's land. In the space of a few hours, the British suffer 57,000 casualties, a third of them killed. It's the worst day in the history of the British Army. But more attacks are ordered, and the battle will rage for another five months. Encouraged by the Russian advance, Romania joins the Allies. But despite an initially successful advance into Transylvania, Romania quickly faces a counter-offensive from German, Bulgarian and Austro-Hungarian forces. And they're largely out position too. Just, just the way their borders are set up, I mean, that's, it's, it's tough, especially going through, because they're fighting two fronts, the North and Southern Front. And Bulgaria has just had mostly just victories too, uh, especially going against Serbia. And most Allied troops have pulled out out of Turkish lands, so I mean they're they're really uncontested. The Allied force at Salonika tries to support Romania by launching their own offensive towards Monastir. Yeah, it's not very effective. With Serbian though. troops in the lead, there are small gains but dogged Bulgarian resistance prevents a breakthrough. Yeah. On the Western Front, General von Falkenhayn finally calls off the attack at Verdun. Jeez. The French army has honoured their commander, General Nivelle's promise. Ils ne passeront pas. They shall not pass. But victory... Insert Gandalf meme here. ...he comes at a terrible price. 365,000 casualties. The Germans lose almost as many. Verdun remains one of the bloodiest battles in human history. For his defeat at Verdun, Falkenhayn is sacked, and Germany's heroes of the Eastern Front, von Hindenburg and Ludendorff, take command in the West. Yeah, they're recalled and put on the, the Western Front. But I mean, really, like, he, he didn't succeed, but he didn't fail. But I mean, it, they all lost in reality. Because I mean, there was just, it was just mincemeat, churning and churning and churning, just horrific. Meanwhile, the Battle of the Somme continues. Near the village of Flair, the British introduce a new weapon they hope can break the deadlock of the trenches. It is called the tank. But despite some small successes, the first tanks are too few in number and too prone to mechanical failure to make any real impact. But it spawned the idea, and that's really kind of the, the credit that goes to it, is because it, it made it a thing where they can actually drive over the trenches and be defended and even though it was poorly made in comparison to ones that in future dates it it was the proof of concept that led the way so i mean credits where credits due on the eastern front russia's brusilov offensive comes to an end casualty estimates vary wildly but it's clear both sides have suffered catastrophic losses Neither the Russian nor the Austro-Hungarian army ever fully recovers. No 
On the Italian front, heavy fighting rages throughout the autumn, as Italian forces make repeated, costly assaults against Austro-Hungarian positions along the Isonzo River. The Battle of the Somme comes to an end amid autumn rain and mud. The Allies have advanced 10 miles at the cost of 600,000 casualties. Jeez. See, like, I don't know, it's just devastating how in, it's so hard fought, inch by inch, mile by mile, or not even mile by mile, yard by yard, that, I mean, it's, that's astronomical. It's hundreds of thousands of men per yard. German losses are about 450,000. The Allies reassure themselves that this is a winning strategy. No. Because at this rate, Germany will run out of men first. That's terrible. That is a terrible strategy. Meanwhile, disaster engulfs Romania as the country is overrun by the Central Powers. Romanian forces suffer a quarter of a million casualties. The remnants of its army take position alongside the Russians on the Eastern Front. Uh, that winter... I mean, they... Yeah, I mean, they... They had the momentum. They were all like, oh, yes! And then they're like, oh, no. Franz Joseph, Emperor of Austria since 1848, uh, dies. He is succeeded by his son, Karl. The last In Britain, Emperor Prime Minister Herbert Asquith is forced from office Empire. and succeeded by David Lloyd George, while General Joffre... And see, and that's an interesting thing, especially just like, especially in times of war where there's that shift in political power of like, like president, emperor, all these things, like that can make such an impact of just the way and perception and stratagems of war, just that change in command th through the rules of that nation. ...is replaced as French commander-in-chief by General Nivelle, who promises victory through bold, aggressive action. Amid the comings and goings, US President Woodrow Wilson's attempts to mediate a peace settlement come to nothing. And really, I mean, even at this point, as I mentioned before, like, Woodrow Wilson won the presidency on a fluke. He was on the Democratic side, and really this was where Teddy Roosevelt really wanted to be president. And he would have, Teddy would have won if the Republicans didn't split the vote, and Teddy didn't form his own party. Uh, I forget what it's called, but it's like the Moose Party, because uh, he's the manly, manliest man to ever man. <laughs> And, uh, yeah. Neither side is...